We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the session Changing Jobs and Skills Test Post COVID and how internet can help. This is a session of the Dynamic Coalition on Internet and Jobs. And as a coalition, we are about leveraging internet for jobs, upskilling, so that you know we bridge the divide. And today, what I'm going to do is uh, walk you through the key findings of our report on Internet and Jobs 2021. So this is our flagship report and uh, we release every year. This is the second in the series. We did one last year. Ideally, I should have been in Poland, but we all know the circumstances, but also that Internet gives us the opportunity to connect online. So I have today some of the legends in the Internet space joining us on the panel from US, Europe, UK, Africa, India and China. I know some of us had problems joining. But in any case, I see my expert panelist, I have Gunjan Sina with me. Gunjan is an internet pioneer. He is the executive chairman of Metric Stream. He is a prominent figure in the Silicon Valley and leads this space as a thinker for the future. And he has shaped the internet, a founder of search engine Who's Where, which is sold in 1998. So you can imagine the kind of leader he is in the internet space. And Gunjan, we are very happy to have you with us. Thank, thank you. Uh, Rajendra, pleasure to be here with all of you in the panel. And I have Professor George Crooks, and he is a legend, a distinguished leader in his field. He was conferred the Order of British Empire in 2011 for his services, a medical director of NHS 24 and director of the Scottish Centre. He is currently the chief executive of the Digital Health and Care Institute, sits on several boards across Europe. Professor Crooks, such a pleasure to have you, and thanks for joining us. Yeah, uh, Professor Yunkup, Konkum. Yunkup is a legend, uh, like Gunjan, almost uh, three decades in internet, and he who actually pioneered e-health at WHO and has led that, and still a relevant authority and sits on the ISFTH board, which has membership in 102 countries, a prominent leader. Yunkup, pleasure to have you and thanks for joining us. Thanks, I have Steve and Joe, and uh, I hope he'll be able to join us. Stephen has served as executive chairman and uh, vice president of Hims Asia Pacific Middle East. He was the director of Intel Corporation and uh, led the e-health group and supply chain at the Asia region. I Brian Kanur, who is the chairman of the European Connected Health Alliance, serves on several startup boards. I hope he's able to join us. He had some issues. We also have a brilliant young Brian Vathagi with us. I have known her as co-founder of Digital Grassroots Kenya. Uh, Internet Society Fellow for Youth at IGF Program, Mozilla Open Leaders Program, and also the Google Policy Fellow. She believes in the right to internet and speaks the voices which people actually kind of avoid. And very uh, happy to have Athegi with you, uh, with us. I know you are in Poland, but we are hosting it online, so it's a mix for us. But glad to have you. So what I'm going to do now uh, today is uh, have the key findings of this report presented. And then we will jump into having your first reactions and question and answers. And we will also take questions from the audience. So I'm going to share my screen and, you know, walk you through what our key findings of the report are. So this is, this is our uh, report, Internet and Jobs 2021. And before I jump into this, I must uh, put this rider that Due to COVID, you know, we had too many surveys going on. So always has an issue in terms of getting uh, responses. But also the other rider we have here is that the respondents essentially are those who had access to internet. So it will have that bias. Uh, and we did touch, uh, we did start this on 23rd of July this year and ended this survey on 20th November. We covered six continents. We covered 46 countries and we covered 87 cities and towns. So in terms of the regions covered, I think we uh, touched all major regions. 
we also looked at the age divide and you know for all those on the panel we should be discussing this issue because this survey always throws up action areas for us and IGF being the uh, you know the key body advising the UN on internet issues we need to address the issues that broaden the divide so if you see this in terms of respondents even 61 years and older the percentage drastically drops we also looked at the respondents profiles so one out of two respondents had a full-time employment which is good we have people who are working part-time we have people who are freelancers we have people self-employed students not employed students who are working part-time not employed looking for paid work not employed not looking for paid work we also had people who lost job during COVID, retired looking for a job and not looking any job uh, if you look at age-wise choices i think uh, clearly we see you know the uh, divide that is the age age based divide you know we, we try to you know look at these um, numbers from the age from the continent at least two three permutation combinations we have tried to analyze this data so how did COVID impact this is a very key thing i think all of us are concerned about so if you look at this four out of ten said that it resulted in the decrease in income almost four out of ten also said that their family income decreased maybe one of their family members had a pay cut or a job loss and uh, my family member lost a job which is like 16 percent of the respondents sadly 12 percent of the respondent also lost a loved one in the family due to COVID. 18 percent of the businesses suffered losses almost like 5.49 percent businesses were shut down and almost two out of ten the studies were adversely impacted due to covid so covid on the other side had this impact we also have the other side which we will see in the subsequent part of this study finding so continent wise if we see i think one of the issues and i know uh, our experts on the panel work globally so is an area for concern there is also an economic divide in terms of internet access which you will see at every time when we look at the continent wise analysis of this uh, study the poorer brothers had little access or you know lesser access when it comes to others developed countries so well on the number side gives us a very good picture to say eight out of ten have uninterrupted supply of internet but those 20 percent who don't are a cause of concern because today the world is connected by internet and during COVID in the last two years we have seen the only way we connected during lockdowns was internet and I think most of us have moved online and we will see that in the findings subsequently how it has changed so I think for us the other issue is also of the access of internet I know one of our young champions here is a firm believer in internet as a public good which we all probably do so if you look at even the continents it again brings us to the developed versus 12 being and not so lucky nations and their populations there is an economic divide for the internet too so internet access uh, we try to figure out where do people access internet and this is we do it every year in our study this is a question that we carry every year in our thing and we try to relate it so nine out of ten Inter have internet access as home. Well. as i said this study looked at people who have are using internet so we believe that this has that bias hopefully as covid you know phases off we will also start doing offline studies so the next year we have a more realistic picture in terms of what's the actual scenario out there six out of ten access internet from office school university the interesting part is 80 percent access internet on cell phone so the world is seeing the convergence to mobile phone and so this is an area where probably there is an action item for us to discuss once we look at these studies that what should we do to increase the access on mobile phones continent wise if you look the numbers again tell the same story uh, in terms of the poorer cousins having lesser responses and access both quality and speed if you look at the low and average quality it is actually not a very good scene and when we look at this number continent wise 
it worries us so only four out of ten have high quality internet i hope we continue with this session without any hassles but there's always a high heartbeat you know when you try to do a session like this which is high stakes and you always think will my network so this is something that we have to look at when the world is moving towards 5g we still have only four out of ten people who have quality uninterrupted access with speed so again when you look at the numbers you know continent wise i think this is the story where we look at the average of high quality low quality it tells us where we are going so did the internet access you know uh, <clears throat> help you in the following so this this brings us to the importance of internet in our daily lives now something that we knew but we didn't practice today we have a proof and the importance of how important is internet so 8 out of 10 believe it is helped in inter in education and studies and research 4 out of 10 in finding a job 4 out of 10 the ben business is benefit out of internet internet helped me in finding a job 7 out of 10 that's a huge huge impact whether you are a student whether you are self employed whether you are into business you cannot be without internet as i keep saying you have to be where your people are and today people are on the internet Sorry, technology always tells you that it will need the human intervention. So again, uh, when we looked at the continent wise, we can see, you know, the uh, regions, the more developed regions have uh, better uh, usage and impact both. And this, in, this presentation will be uploaded on the IGF website in a day or so for everyone. Uh, but I think the analysis continent wise makes it better to understand rather than a generalized global estimate this is a very interesting uh, point that has come up that how many of the people who responded made money using internet so one out of two which means that the lives are getting positively impacted for those who can leverage internet for increasing incomes or for you know incomes as such so that's a huge number to look at age wise if you see yes that's again a age divide that we need to look at this also came out in our last year study that people who are above 60 have issue of how do they leverage internet but here also you will see from 25 to 50 you have and it tapers down as the age increases the utilization of internet or leveraging internet decreases i think with increasing longevity we have a serious issue to address and an important one Again, we looked at continent wise, I think numbers follow the same trend. Do you believe their job or business will gradually become obsolete post COVID? So two out of 10 believes yes, but eight out of 10 think no. And this is an area that I'm currently researching, you know, as a project of sustainable automation, uh, that where will it lead us? Uh, that's a different study we will release later. That's a longer study we are doing across countries, across professions and across sectors. But for this study, the responses we got from the so-called 46 countries is that 20% believe yes, which is a serious, I think, thing for us to discuss and deliberate. Age-wise, you can see that those who are leveraging maximum have this response of yes also increasing. It decreases with age because I think the utilization is also less when the age increases for internet. So this, this we did continent wise, the same trend follows, not any different. So believe that you have the skills to use. So interestingly, eight out of 10 say yes, but 17, 18% say no, we don't have the skills. And that is something that we need to first dig deeper as a part of the follow up study is that what do they understand by their skills? Is it just it, uh, the operating the internet or it is more than that? Because Access to internet also takes you to wider gamut of opportunities for leveraging technology. Continent-wise, if you see, this is the same. The developed nations have uh, responses which follow a definite trend and the poorer cousins who don't have that. So when it comes to internet, which of the following apply? So the best part is nine out of 10 believe that internet will create local economies and support businesses. 
that is a very important finding. Nine out of 10 also believe internet will help local businesses to go national and global. Eight out of 10 believe it will lead to more incomes. Eight out of 10 believe it will create jobs which didn't exist today, which we know we are seeing that. And so eight out of 10 believe that businesses will, will create businesses which don't exist today, but one out of four also believe that will create take jobs and kill businesses. And that is something that we should as IGF, as Dynamic Coalition on Internet and Jobs, I think deliberate on that how could we avoid as much as we can. To maximize the uh, opportunities through the internet, there are very clear actionables. I think it is about trainings that we see. Uh, you know, the internet is expensive. 10% almost believe that. Uh, the 20% of the respondents didn't know the opportunity internet offers, but they do use internet. On the policy ecosystem, I think is a big gap. So there's a policy divide too, where six out of 10 believe that they don't have a conducive policy ecosystem to leverage the full potential of internet. And the interesting part is three out of 10 will start an internet business, based business this year, and almost three out of 10 currently run a business. So I think if we look at this, this means a lot more going forward in the year next that we will see that 30% increase in entrepreneurs which are internet driven. Again, we looked at the social media thing and we looked at how it is benefiting. So seven out of 10 believe there are increases the chances of getting a job and helps in growth of business. Uh, which is 9 out of 10, which is a very interesting angle of how social media has been utilized for business. Same trend follows continent wise when we split it and same trend probably follows when we look at age wise. So this slide, if we look at also shapes our thinking in terms of what it means for the future of work. So if you look at 50.55, this is, this is like one out of two people moved work totally online in the current role. If you add the second one, which is part of the role moved online, eight out of 10 people actually change the way they work. Will this change last is something we will see, but will it change for sure? It'll change how long it will change, how much it will change. We'll have to see. We know a country moved to four and a half days of work last week. So these are changes that we are seeing in terms of the definition of jobs. Same thing that is going continent wise, if you see and follow. The developed world has a different trend, the developing world has a different trend. This is interesting. If you look at the numbers, if we, if we look at four to 10 hours, the people that use the internet, that's a good 80.21%. That's the dependence on the internet. And if you look at five to 10 hours, it is 75, 76%. That means that people are spending more time on the net and this means that there's a whole opportunity and the people you, you have to be in business where your customers are and people are on the virtual in the virtual world. So this is again a big, big change that is happening. Again, age wise, if you see brings us same to the age divide that people above 60, you will see the numbers are a little different and others as well. So what needs to change? I think very clear messages that come out from this study is that they need entrepreneurial training and courses to make sure that they use this opportunity, a funding ecosystem, a startup ecosystem that has to be there and uninterrupted access to internet. Uh, entrepreneur friendly rules and regulations. If you look at the ecosystem, clearly people are articulating what exactly are they looking at when it comes to the internet. We asked them that, do you think that big companies uh, have benefited you? So four out of 10 believe that they have made a significant contribution to boosting job and business opportunities, uh, have created wealth for their founders and positively impacted life. That is one out of four. 15% believe that they created wealth for the founders, but they have taken away jobs and businesses because that's a relative question in terms of the large, big, big tech, you know, uh, and this is something that we have to look and I have made a point always at IGF meetings that we have to shape the future in a sense that do we want large number of small companies in the internet or do we want small number of large companies that will make a fundamental difference in how we drive the economy of the world and bridge the divide. 
This is again the trend that follows continent wise. So this, this will be uploaded and our report will be available on uh, the dynamic coalition of internet and jobs, a detailed report based on these findings. And I think it will be interesting for us to trigger. So I'll not stop screen sharing and, you know, I'll move to the, uh, the Q and A. So coming first is that I am going to ask my fellow panelists, what is the first reaction on the findings of internet and job 2021 so gunjan it's to you first thank you uh, dr gupta and it's a pleasure to be here on the panel uh, i think one of the the most telling revelations that came to me was was as uh, you shared the very last question the point that you made around do we need large number of small companies to really drive the you know the equitable uh, wealth distribution as it as the internet presents or do we want a, a, a small number of large companies and as you looked at the some of the findings that you saw there uh, it was very clear that entrepreneurship is at the cornerstone you know of all of this stuff so if you look at the internet and i've seen the internet develop from 1990s when when i started and you know, right here in the Silicon Valley, you know, creating one of the earliest search engines to where we are today. So the full potential of the internet comes because when you build local economies, creating real businesses led by real entrepreneurship. So we need education online to create entrepreneurial ecosystems. We need to build an entrepreneurial ecosystem through online learning where people can become future entrepreneurs. And I do believe entrepreneurship can be trained you know, I grew up in India, I moved to the United States, you know, I know entrepreneurship can be trained and you can start with very little to build something that is part of your dream and vision. Uh, we do need to have a funding ecosystem around it, whether it's seed funding, angel funding, VC funding, and I think public policy has to start to drive that. And we need a strong startup ecosystem. All of this has to be made affordable because as you do that, and as you make this accessible, that's when you start to create the real promise of the internet, which is not to create the digital divide, but to create the digital inclusion when you can have large number of small companies propelling the world economy. And that is where the future is. And that's where the public policy should be. And that's where collectively our thinking should be. And that's what harnesses the power of the internet moving forward. Thanks, Gunjan. Sir George Crooks, what's your view, what's your take when you look at these findings uh, of the internet and jobs? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much again for inviting me to participate. I mean, for me, the thing that leaps out at me is that we are now recognizing that uh, connectivity um, and being able to be online is a social determinant of health. Um, and we need to recognize that. And this, this whole issue about inclusivity as opposed to exclusivity is something that we need to actually focus on. I mean, I was interested in that a number of the slides that people were actually asking for more enabling policies within their country and within their regions to support them, both to access the internet and to get best value out of it. Because just as our, our, our last contributor said, it can be a great enabler. And for me, this is about not engineering human connectivity and face-to-face -face interaction out of our daily lives, far from it. It's actually about how we enable more high quality face-to-face -face valued care um, and when it is needed, where it's needed uh, and so on and so forth. So for me, it's about intelligent design. It's making sure that we don't just have accessibility, we make sure the quality of the content that people can access um, can be assured and trusted. And we really haven't understood uh, how to do that in a, in a safe, but not over-regulated or over-monitored way. Thanks, Sir Crooks. Yunkab, you have moved continents and you have also moved the, um, I would say, digital ecosystems and working at multilateral bodies, and you still engage actively across the world. What's your view on the findings? Thank you very much, uh, Raj. Um, I, I find them quite interesting. I totally agree with the comments 
uh, made by the earlier speakers. Um, I, I want to preface my remarks by saying that my, my main focus is health, uh, much like, like Georgia you know, talked about social determinants of health. So I see the health aspects. I look at everything pretty much through a, a health lens. And one of the, um, I saw some things in the report that I expected, the, the issues with, um, with connectivity, uh, which by the way, if you drill down further, there's one major, major piece that needs to come up, probably wasn't part of your remit in the study, is that of electrical power, reliable electrical power. It's at the base of everything that hurts availability of the internet um, in many developing countries. So that's something uh, to be explored. Um, the, the, thing, the other thing that I saw, which I expected and which really uh, calls for attention is the equity issue. It's whether you call it inclusivity or the digital divide, there's a need you know, for equity, particularly in health. And when you say health in the 21st century, you're talking about knowledge-based systems which, for which the underpinning is information and communication technology, much like in the 20th century, it was imaging systems. In the 19th century, it was chemistry and the pharmaceutical uh, businesses. So in the 21st century, it's, the, it's digital that drives, um, that underpins health systems. And when you talk about digital, clearly, you know, the internet, is a, is a huge part of that. So we cannot pretend to, to discuss universal health coverage, which means everyone having access to a health service when they need it. You cannot pretend to have that as a goal if you do not provide access. And when we say access, a lot of the access comes through uh, instruments or platforms like, like the internet, uh, because the, the, the major part of what happens when people seek and get health services is communicating and information sharing. Uh, there is the tactile, there's the uh, pharmaceuticals and things that are tangible, but a huge part that underlies uh, health interactions is information and sharing. So I see uh, a lot of work to be done and getting back uh, briefly, to the equity issues, the, the message that comes through very clearly is that equal treatment does not always mean equal outcomes. And therefore, specific work needs to be done in the area of equity. Thank you. Thanks, Yunkab. So very interesting, uh, you know, flow and the priorities. I think that's what happens when you get a constellation of stars. So Gunjan highlighted the importance of education. Sir George Crooks talked about health and Junka brought for the important issue of infrastructure. If you don't even have electricity, what about internet? So moving this to Vathagi, Vathagi, you have been a, a grassroots worker and worked at different parts and geographies and you're very enthusiastic about issues that matter to the free internet. What's your take on the findings of the study? Oh yeah, thank you very much. Um... Yeah, I would have to agree with also um, the other speakers. And um, what I really found interesting about this report was um, your mention of the digital skills gap. And um, as the uh, previous speakers also said, and um, at the start of the pandemic, I was living in Kenya and in the middle of the pandemic that is still ongoing, I moved to uh, Germany. And I could really definitely tell the, um, the differences in the two countries and, uh, uh, what was happening. Um, I would, which made me also have like another um, definition of what the global south is because um, the city that I did actually move into in Germany, I felt like I was more in the south than when I was living in Kenya because I was living in the capital and um, it, uh, connectivity was much uh, lower and more difficult here. So in terms of the skills gap, um, I have noticed that uh, uh, that the challenges you brought out in your report, um, uh, there's like a variety of challenges, there's technical challenges, structural, cultural, and and um, also like uh, in, uh, 
capacity challenges. And I, 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 I felt that although structural challenges uh, are always number one, we need infrastructure for social and economic equity. Um, I feel there's also a, a cultural issue uh, where different generations differ in terms of um, skill sets. Um, because um, previously I saw uh, in the recent past, um, the UK has been trying to uh, fill in very many job vacancies. There's about like 80% job vacancies and most, I mean, 80% of the job vacancies are digital jobs. Uh, I mean, they, they are jobs that require digital skills. The only problem is that these companies don't want um, to give chances to the um, older, uh, to adults. They only want to give learning opportunities to younger people. And which doesn't make sense because now uh, we're going through a, a very strange period where people need reskilling and upskilling. And um, I like that uh, this report pointed it out. And uh, and it's, 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 it's a thing that, uh, needs to be addressed like uh, I think like employers should offer ways to reskill people and or upskill uh, and change skills and find ways probably even if they're not very digital uh, ways ways to navigate like uh, um, how to teach this other generation that doesn't really really want probably to be tech savvy in quotes I use that loosely uh, into the uh, into the uh, internet sphere and the digital sphere in terms of work. So um, that the, the, the big thing that I captured in your, uh, in this report was the digital skills gap that needs to really be um, uh, evaluated and we have to figure out how to <coughs> deal with this. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Vatagi. Uh, it is a very interesting uh, vantage point for the entire humanity, I think for policymakers and those who look at economic issues you know we have been talking about multiple things and the way the world is i think not only are the economic models but also the internet models will have to undergo a paradigm shift you rightly said that 80 percent jobs are in digital space and you default by default need digital skills if you're into anything today now this brings me i i looked at this report i looked at every every aspect of this report and the last year's report so I see that the divide in the internet world has multiple dimensions. It has a policy divide, it has a quality divide, it has an access divide, it has an age divide, it has a gender divide. <laughs> the last report shows, you know, that women are the worst sufferers because they're left behind in the digital world, sadly. And there is a funding divide. There's a divide between rich and poor nations. And the rich nations obviously stand to benefit. And most of the people on my panel today are the people who have moved from the one world to the other, from third world to the first and seen the difference and made a big difference. But they couldn't do that in their country. Had they been, probably they couldn't have done that. This brings me to a very important point. And I, I remember speaking in the UN General Assembly Hall in 2011, 10 years ago, that we will have a generation 30, 40 years from now saying we had an irresponsible generation that did not take care of children. We are at a very different vantage point today. We would be a generation we have not taken take care of our older adults or seniors. I mean, you look at the divide. So, Gunjan, this brings me to a question that where people above the age of 60 have a serious uh, handicap in terms of not being upskilled or not being, you know, trained. I, as we see, the longevity increases, the, uh, the inclusiveness with regards to internet decreases because you're left behind. There are no courses for you. And I think you brought out this important point. You started with the point saying online education is the way to go. And that's what we need. So what are the things that you would suggest that we take care of the older adults or seniors or whatever name we would call them? Because we would have to take care of them above the age of 60. They will live for 30 years. That's almost half their age. Yeah. And and uh, yeah professor gupta i i would i would say that you know the internet as i said is the great connectivity point and if you start to think about online uh, uh model where you can actually have the the seniors in the society you know people above 60 uh connected economically uh it does two couple of things here from a from a health perspective their engagement gives them economic 
income, but it also gives them engagement, which is an important part of their overall ability to take care of the health. So I come back to a little bit of the economics of saying, how do we engage these people who have been, you know, who have done many things in their lives, now they're about 60, and in that age group, if we can example uh, the through online mentoring, education, and engagement, tap into their wealth of knowledge and experience, and create an engagement of fractional work, freelanced work, and that work gives them engagement. And it's been very documented that people who are engaged rather than not engaged, you know, help end up living healthier lives because it gives them an occupation, it gives them economic income, it gives them ability to access healthcare and other things that come with economic uh, ability. So I really go back to saying, how do we connect the internet and have network of online resources and education for the seniors or mentoring for the seniors. And this mentoring can happen by other seniors who are in a privileged countries and privileged spots, but also from younger generation as a give back uh, because it's the, it's, the, it's the trust between the younger generation and the older generation to engage in a social fabric which the internet can actually create. So I can totally envision a future where younger generation are actually mentoring people who are in the seniors to be able to help them engage better and build an economic platform for the seniors. Excellent. I think this can be a big leveler. It can also be a big connector. And this brings back us to the point of that, that we are humans. I think we need to, we cannot close our eyes to the reality that's with us. Uh, Sir George Crooks, your views on how to bridge this divide, which is age related. Uh, I, th I think this is, I mean, this is a really important point. And just to, to build on what was just said earlier, um, we need to be able to unlock the knowledge, skills, and experience that each and every one of us, whatever our position in society has through that lived experience and make that available to the community. Um, and it is about being valued and feeling valued that actually promotes well-being. Um, now, we all know that... Um, user-centered design is key to unlocking that. And we really haven't invested the time and effort in doing that. We design, wherever you are in the world, most public services are configured in the way where you have to change the way you interact uh, with the service to be able to access it. Whereas we need to be able to access services on our own terms. We need, we need to be able to access education and training on our own terms. We know that people now learn best through watching videos, not reading books or sitting in a lecture hall. We need to make those types of things accessible and the internet can do that, but we need to talk the language that people can understand and not talk down to people. So for me, it all comes down to user-centered design it, and however you cut it, there needs to be brave policy leadership wherever you are in the world to drive that forward, as well as building on bottom up support. So it's all about communities. They may be geographical communities, but what the internet does, it allows you to bring together communities of interest to actually empower, engage and enable. And I just think there's a great opportunity. We just need to realize how to harness it properly. Thank you, Sir Crooks. You cut the important point and the area that you have been involved in. I think the point that is made about the user-centered design and the fact that we need to speak the language that people understand. And the point he makes is more profound when you consider the age, their experience, and their experience for the new world, which is totally different. We talk about metaverse today, you know, something that we didn't talk three years ago. And three weeks ago, we made it like a big thing. Everyone is talking about metaverse. So Yunka, what do you feel, you know, we need to avoid a big catastrophe. And if we leave these people behind, unskilled, not knowing the internet and the way we are seeing the usage, we would be creating a physical health problem, we'll be creating a mental health problem for them. How do we avoid that using the internet besides engagement? I think Gunjan made this very important point about engaging them. How do we address that? Over to you, Yunka. Thank, thanks again, Raj. Uh, I, I think very good points have been made by the previous speakers about how to um, 
um, engage the, the elderly. Let me just underscore these, the, these um, recommendations made earlier. If you look at the, um, the European Commission's active and healthy aging, uh, it's a model that rests on a number of, of, uh, of platforms. And two of those platforms are lifelong learning and community engagement. So very much in line with what my colleagues uh, have been telling us, and that if you want to live longer in an active, high quality life, you need to engage. There are also things like you know, food and nutrition, healthcare services, et cetera, et cetera, but engagement and lifelong learning. So it's, it's the, I think the solution stems from there. And, and as George said, if, if there's bold leadership at the policy level, to provide the environment within which this learning, lifelong learning takes place. And I think uh, we're off to a great start. I find it sometimes, is, it's quite intriguing that for the longest time we've been trumpeting the, uh, the value of people-centered health services. And for quite some time, if you looked at what that meant was when a patient went to a health setting, the descriptions about people-centered health services started with what the services would do, could offer the patient, as opposed to, I think what you were saying, George, is what does the patient want and where can they get that, those, those services? It's a totally different mindset from looking at everything from what the services do, as opposed to what people actually want. And guess what? The most abundant resource on the health system is the people who serve various roles. They can be the clients. I don't like the word patients. They can be the clients. They uh, sometimes could be providers. They could sometimes be stewards of the system. And these are the three major categories that people play in health services. So everybody has an interest in making sure that we leverage the power of technology to improve all aspects uh, of the health system. How do you, how do, you do it in, for, for, for seniors? I think seniors, and I have a vested interest in this because I'm one myself. Um, I think seniors, we have so much to offer. Going back to, to, to knowledge, think about, let's just take three of the, uh, if you're not a senior, please forgive me. Let's take the three, uh, Gentlemen, the three of us who I think are seniors here, if if George knew everything that I knew, and I knew everything that George knows, and our colleague from California knows, just think about the power of being able to solve all sorts of problems. So knowledge sharing, in my view, is the one paradigm that can make us achieve leaps, quantum leaps of success in whatever issue we're addressing in the health space for sure, because of two facts. One is that we use much more, much only a, a tiny fraction of what we know. So we need to bridge what we used to call in the noughties, the no do gap, apply more of what we know. And secondly, have more people share what we know with many more people. If we did those two little things, I think we'd achieve so much more. So uh, I'll end there for now, but when you get down to actual jobs creation, we also have some suggestions that we'd make, I hope, later in the program. Thanks, Junkab. So, Bathagi, if I look at what Gunjan, Sir Crooks, and Junkab said, so if I look at all what they're suggesting, internet can provide quantum power to solve the biggest challenges of humanity but you cannot remain disconnected you need to engage yes. so as a young activist enthusiast and person who has been a policy fellow how do you see the world ahead what do you do yeah well i i really like the suggestions that uh or the opinions from all the gentlemen this opinions that have been given i especially like the citizen-centered approach. Um, I, I think that's truly the way to go because what's the purpose of all this? Um, we have to uh, 
look at the citizen and I love the uh, that I didn't even know it was one of the UN goals, the uh, harnessing technology to enable lifelong learning. And I believe that's really important uh, for uh, uh, the uh, all people in all stages of life in general. Um, everyone, it, it's, it's important to be able to use, you know, the tools that we all have around us to be able to enhance our lifelong learning. And this can bring me to an example of when I, I moved from Kenya to Germany and um, my doctor couldn't send me an email because they didn't know how to use an email. And this was the, my first time personally to see a fax machine. So, which means they have technology already. It's just that um, there's just different types of technology right now. I, and I, I mean, it was really a very new experience. I have never seen a fax machine in my life and I and I saw one and I saw I so actually I was taught how to use a fax machine so someone else can be taught how to use an email or you know so and I I, I think we can just all use technology in a different way and um, uh, the first thing which I think was the spirit of every speaker's um, point was we have to like size up the problem see what really um, everybody needs and see how we can set up plans to build a, a workforce uh, environment uh, uh, digitally to improve uh, to improve how, 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 how things work in future. Like, uh, for example, um, people might have different interests in different stages of life. Um, and these days we we, we've kind of seen like from 1900s or from even the, the 1960s, 70s, people had to have like a, a college degree or whatever. These days you can be hired without a college degree. Even some of the richest people are 16 years old on TikTok. So we, we, we have to uh, uh, appreciate that times are changing and not everyone can be the same. So people can have a different skill at 50, a different one at 70, a different one at 80 and a different interest at the same time. Um, and I, I feel I have been the same way in my career. And I believe people are different at different stages of their lives. And we can't expect the same tailor or the same graphic designer to want to be a graphic designer later. So we have to just see what the problem is, what needs to be changed. Do we need to upskill them, reskill them, change their skills? And how can we harness technology to do these things? So. Um, that's Thanks, how, Matagi. How I feel Thanks, like Matagi. Absolutely. You know, I was among the nine people who were involved in drafting the national education policy, and I totally agree with what you say. I think that the the time of the four world campuses is done. Gunjan made this point at the very beginning, opening it with saying online education is the way to go. I think the time has come for us to relook at education beyond four walls. It's five fingers. You know, digital is digits. Digits is fingers. So that's where it is. The digital is not just about the world that say it's about these digits. Having said that, the study said that half of the people have moved fully online. If you look at people, you know, moving part of the jobs online, it's above 80%. Now, will this mean that the definition of jobs will change, which used to be nine to five, which is no more nine to five. We all know it for the last two years. So Gunjan, you have seen all ages of the internet. I don't think we even thought about computers when you, you know, uh, launched who's where the first kind of search engine. You're a pioneer in this space and you have been a leader in this space. Now, looking at this journey of almost four decades, do you think that the definition of jobs will change in the age of internet? And if it, that is going to change, what would that mean? Yeah, no, that's a... Great question, uh, Dr. Gupta. I, I do think that uh, what internet presents is an ability for an amazing environment of online collaboration and jobs that were originally thought of as monolithic jobs are gonna become collaborative workflows. Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, let's say three of us, you know, one could be three people can come together to do something in a faster, better, cheaper way, in a more effective and efficient way uh, to make something happen that traditionally would have been one person's contribution in a more monolithic sense of the word jobs. So I feel you're gonna become more fractionalized 
task-oriented, freelance-oriented environment and tethered by technology and software that allows people to be able to collaborate effectively on literally micro tasks. Uh, and that fragmentation and will lead to hyper-specialization. And the hyper-specialization is, is a very powerful concept because if all of us can specialize in our little things that we really become good at, and we can stitch that together on demand in the cloud, coming together to solve a particular problem or deliver a particular task, that, that is where the future is in my mind. So micro tasks, hyper specialization, you know, global collaboration that enables all of this is I think where the world is going, you know, in the next five, 10 years as, as I see uh, the power of the internet and technology ahead of us. Thanks, Gunjan. I think very, very important and deep statement you make. And if I, you know, understand it correctly, the jobs in office are moving to jobs on the cloud, which effectively means collaboration, micro jobs specific, task oriented, and it's projects, not jobs. That's a big transition, but that's the way the world has moved now. Sir George Crooks, what do you think about this? What's the new job scenario definition for you? I absolutely agree with what's been said. I mean, I, we begin to, to stop noticing the change because it is so subtle, but it is so, so large. So for example, everyone who's part of today's session, 10 years ago, we were using money as currency uh, in our purses or in our wallets or in our pockets. I can't remember the last time I paid for anything. Uh, using coins. Um, it is all now online. Um, the COVID uh, pandemic has meant that we have been celebrating family special occasions virtually. Um, we have been, believe it or not, ordering um, meals from some of the best restaurants in the UK that get delivered to your house. So in fact, we're not only creating um, economic advantage through new online services. We're also creating manual and other jobs supporting that cloud-based uh, infrastructure. And this is the way we're going to go. But really going back to the last point, which is really important, we have got significant challenges around the world. We've got the issues around about climate change. We've got the issues about inequality and equity. Uh, we've got the major challenge around about coronavirus. And that needs collaboration. The days of us being able to rely on the knowledge within our own communities, within our own countries are over. Um, you know, we, the virus, for example, doesn't respect international boundaries. Knowledge should not respect international boundaries. A bit like um, how we used to deal with our money in the past, anything that was valuable, we locked up in a physical building, which we called a bank. People were ridiculous and bought, you know, great masters work, works of art. And rather than putting it in the walls of their house or a gallery to look at, they locked it in a vault because it was so valuable. Nobody got to see it. And that's what we've done with our intellect up until now. And we're only now liberating that and putting that out there. But actually, going back to what we said earlier, everyone has got something to contribute. You don't need to have an IQ of 150. It's having lived experience and being able to share that lived experience is fundamentally important. In the healthcare system, we have demonstrated that a newly diagnosed uh, diabetic aged 50, who is a manual worker in the building industry, has difficulty relating to a 25 year old young doctor telling them how to manage their diabetes. But if we put them in touch with another 50 year old manual worker in the building industry who has got diabetes, who then explains how they manage it in their day to day life, because they understand the lived experience of an individual. These things are more powerful and more effective. So we have to stop thinking in the way we have in the past and really open our minds to the new opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Junka, we also know the other change that's happening. On one side, we are saying we need to skill people, but the other side, we have machine learning. Things keep advancing with the algorithm. 
So how do you see, you know, the uh, definition of jobs changing in your stream in the times to come? Will we need more people, professionals like doctors, nurses, uh, physiotherapists, or will machines be doing a job? How do we bridge those divides? Well, thanks, Raj. You know, very, uh, very key question. But let me just, um, before I, I respond to that, just uh, echo and, and thank my, uh, the, the previous speakers, Gunja and George and Watagi. Um, the idea of, you know, collaboration, I think is just fundamental and capital. Um, so I, I want to inform everyone that the International Society for Telemedicine and eHealth, which I serve as executive director, has an initiative called the Global Knowledge Commons. It's based on the principle of answering the question, who is doing what, where, how well is it working? What can we learn from it? And what can we share and reuse from it? I think it's, it's a very powerful paradigm and we'd like um, you know, others to join us uh, in this effort. Now, now to, your, to your question, uh, I think if you look at what we've learned from the pandemic, uh, COVID has taught us a lot, but the, I think the major lesson is that we can do so much more than we used to think before from wherever we are. So the idea of tele, and you can add any suffix that you want, tele work, tele play, tele, uh, uh, tele um, dining, <laughs> almost, uh, all of these things, you can add whatever suffix you want, and there's a possibility uh, in, in, the in our future, because I believe the pandemic has served as a global proof of concept that we can do these things, you know, even uh, from wherever we are. So if you translate that into the health sector, for example, um, I, I, you notice that in health, I think the, the job functions are very disjointed. You have functions that are performed by a, a doctor, functions performed by a nurse, functions performed by this. Um, I think we need to go, and the internet and the future will let us uh, go in that direction, to where we have many more categories to fill the gaps between the various, um, various existing categories. I'll give you a clear example. Um, in, in, in many African uh, health systems, there is no such position as a physician assistant. You either see a doctor or you see a, a nurse. We need that space between the two sets of functions covered by a professional, recognized professional. So um, pretty much going to what Gunjan pointed out, where everybody has a tiny sliver of the spectrum of functions to be performed to keep a society healthy. And they specialize in that bit, but you, to borrow your term, Gunjan, stitch them together with collaboration and, and connectivity. So it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful ideal to, to look at, but it's a long way uh, to get there. So I think that's what the future holds. Health, in, in health alone, the internet has the possibility to create so many, many uh, opportunities for work. Uh, we, know, we know now that pandemics are going to occur and occur and occur again. So pandemic preparedness alone provides opportunities for remote monitoring of so many parameters. There are jobs to be created in these areas, de developing the devices to capture sensors, to capture these uh, the biological and physiological data uh, systems to, to, to AI, for example, to analyze the data and make predictions and, and do models. There's so much more that we can do, you know, um, with the internet, you know, in the health system. And this will create many positions, uh, as I said. Um, so this is just a, 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 a small example. There, there, there are many, many others that uh, one can think of. So I think the automation is not going to uh, replace health workers, not by a long shot. What the automation would do is transform them, much like 
the the uh, the word processor did not obviate uh, the need for a secretary. It simply transformed him or her into an executive assistant. Nicer, nicer title. Sounds <laughs> more impressive. So that's what is going to happen uh, in health as well, where the health workers are going to be transformed into e-practitioners and the clients of the health system themselves are going to be transformed from passive observers in the health, um, passive observers to active participants in the therapeutic or health restoration uh, processes that they engage in. So I think it's a win-win for, for all of us. Thank you. Hi, thanks, Yunkab. You're always brilliant in articulating how technology helps. Uh, Vatagi, you know, you are, you know, the one who is the future, you know, where you are and given your diverse roles as a policy fellow with Mozilla, Google and others being very active on IGF, I've been seeing you for a couple of years. How do you see this job scenario? Where do you see yourself being ready to do and what to do in the next five years, given the way internet and automation is growing? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the previous speakers. That was very um, enlightening. I also like that example of the word processor because I was thinking we still use accountants despite the fact that we have spreadsheets, you know? So that was really good. So yeah, the, in, um, the internet is really not taking away jobs. It's just changing jobs. So um, so in, in answering you, um, there was this report that was done by the World Economic Forum where they, they were checking how many jobs, how many job losses will occur uh, because of, of uh, digitalization. And uh, so job losses were estimated to be about five to 10 million. And, and then they further did another uh, uh, research where they were searching for uh, looking at how many jobs will be created and um, the jobs that were estimated to be created by digitalization were 58 million so when you compare those figures uh, we can just say I, I mean if you're a utilitarian you will uh, say let's have the more jobs uh, and let the five to ten million jobs be lost and let's have the more jobs and I am of that um, point of view but at the same time I also feel that um, what will happen to these people who've lost their jobs? So I, uh, my, my mind is that we, we need to find a way to make sure they do something. As we've been, we've been talking, the whole theme of this uh, uh, panel has been, we have to make sure everybody is included. So inclusivity has been a running theme and, uh, and we have to think how can we include them? So uh, I, I, at the same time, I see, problems that will occur in future because of um, digitalization. I mean, we are already in a pandemic, a, a disease pandemic, like a physical pandemic, right? And um, there's been talk since the pandemic started, uh, cybercrime has been rising and stuff like by 900% in countries like the US. And there has been talks in many places of a cyber pandemic. So, but I think the thing with the COVID pandemic was lack of preparation. So I think in, if we are going to digitalize and we want to move to digital work and stuff like that, how are we going to prepare? Because we are talking about the future of work, right? How are we going to prepare for such, um, such occurrences? Like how would we prepare for the future of the cyber pandemic? Um, people have been saying um, it could lead to the bringing down of the grid, the power grid. I mean, um, conspiracy theorists, but I don't feel like it's a conspiracy theory because sometimes the cyber pandemic could be too wide. And then also we have to think if something like that were to happen, since we, we want the future of work to be digital and everyone included, then what, what do we do? What do we do then? Uh, because everyone just knows, wake up, sit in my computer or touch my, my phone, my laptop, blah, blah, blah. And no one knows, everyone will be like, oh my God, how do I make something like salty water drinkable? You know, things like that, like physical skills since we've moved completely digital. Um, and I, and um, so I, how I see it in the future, it's, I don't feel that digital, uh, uh, digitalization and building digital skills is to replace the physical element of life. I feel like it's to 
improve it and and make it better so so i i my my suggestion would probably be smart work i would say something like smart work, like the way we do smart a smart city something like smart work and smart work is for the benefit of the citizens building and increasing the the livelihood of the citizens so as long as it's making the lives of the citizen better i think we go with it because the, on, at the same time uh, uh, digitalization has its uh, its own bad outcomes also climate change is surprisingly one of the sessions i attended on tuesday affecting affected by digital, digitalization like data processing like too much data processing is bad for climate and I, I attended a session called green data processing and I had that's something I had never thought about and um, and I, I uh, my, my mind is that um, at the same time as we're like oh yes let's do digitalization go to work the way I could never you know I, I, I want to do just um, stuff online we have to think in terms of um, how far is it making things better and how far is it making things worse and like find a kind of like strike a balance so i wouldn't i i don't enjoy the term remote work i enjoy more the term smart work because um smart work means okay i am comfortable i can take a shower on my on my coffee break or on my lunch break i can i can walk my dog i can like it's, it's it's more about improved quality of life and uh if i have a baby i'll take care of it or something like that so i i would i would be more of the idea that digitalization in the next few years will improve the quality of work and then we will be working smart in in quotes um uh, uh, as opposed to remote work let's all stay home and be on our devices um if if um if you get what i mean so in the future i i i do love working remotely and have been for a couple of years but i feel that i have had a better quality of of life when i define my boundaries and and said like like do we have tools like at five o'clock or at four o'clock or five or whatever time that you are not contacted that there, there's just so much more to to digitalization than just oh yeah you have internet and you have a computer or you have whatever and you can um and you can just work. So I feel like there's just different arenas and we will have to, as previous speakers keep saying, and that's like a term that I will now adopt, uh, citizen-centric, citizen-centered. I don't know which one it is, but it's putting the person at the middle and looking at solutions that um, are more for the person and not for, for innovation and all, because the point of innovation is to make the life of the person at the end of the day better. Okay. Thanks for that. So we have next 10 minutes, we have three questions still to be answered, which is, you know, as the dynamic coalition on internet jobs, we got to also answer the hard questions. So I think in the next questions, I would expect my expert panelists to be brief to a minute. So my first question is, you know, that we have seen the divide, we need to find solutions. And with this kind of uh, illustrious panel, uh, we can't let that question go. So knowing the divide that we have, do, do we need a solution like the USOF, which India has, I am sure other countries all, it's called the Universal Services Obligatory Fund. So out of the auction of the spectrum for the internet, a part of the money is retained and brought back to rural areas where good connectivity is there. Now, do we need something like that in the world? An institution like IGF recommends that, you know, let's leverage this, so Gunjan, over to you. What's your view in terms of bridging this digital divide? Do we need something like USOF for the world? You're on mute, Gunjan. Gunjan, you're on mute. Hold for a second. Yeah, can you hear guys hear me? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So, uh, you know, that's a great question. And, and I've been, you know, thinking about, you know, I mean, the internet is here. Uh, and uh, and we've talked about the, the challenge, the digital divide, but I think I just want to take 30 seconds to kind of highlight one of the best, big tectonic shifts happening with the advent of ESG, environmental and social governance. And I think we touched upon, you know, where the world is today with the risks of climate, uh, the responsibility that we have towards the society, the social governance, and creating a more equitable and just 
uh, platform for all the people in the world, not just for select few. So when you start to think about the intersection of the internet and ESG, uh, and you couple that with making ESG the umbrella, and that could also be an organization. Like, you know, in the past we've had, you know, organizations like the World Bank created for specific purposes. There've been organizations created for specific agenda. But if you start to take the theme of ESG and you create a platform organization whose charter is to really drive environmental and social governance globally at scale, leveraging the power of the internet and bringing down the digital divide in that process, creating a world which is environmentally sustainable and sustainable is a key word here. I think that is where lies the answer, but it does need an organization to be created. Our risks right now are inherent to the planet. There is no plan B. We, you know, we got to take care of this planet. Uh, and, you know, the organizations like UN got created, you know, after the world wars and so forth. I think the very existence of this planet is at risk here. So when you think about it, an organization, Dr. Gupta, that you suggested, makes a lot of sense, but I would make the charter of that organization to really leverage the power of the internet to deliver the real promise of environmental and social governance at scale, to create equity, diversity and inclusion, and use that as a platform organization. Thanks, Gunjit. So we have exactly five minutes left. So I would go back for key takeaways, starting with each one. Uh, because we got to also minute the proceedings which will get uploaded so first uh Vathagi, for you your key takeaways on the internet and job scenario in less than a minute um the internet and job scenario i believe the internet and job scenario um is very promising and uh contrary to popular belief what i because of what you said it got to my mind um i don't think we need more organizations because we have already too many and what are they doing why are they not doing stuff and they should be doing uh, uh things and so we will just have organizations for the sake of having them and they they should actually be doing things and i think there's so many organizations in this sphere that can work together to uh to bridge the divide. And the other thing I, I, I think is that um, education is really important. There's very many uh, educations, uh, uh, educational programs um, that provide incentives, for example, here in Germany, for older people or any someone who is unemployed. There's this running ad that always happens. Are you employed in Germany? Here, come learn for free and then get a job and then you can only pay us once you have a job and we give you a job. So creating incentives in such a sphere in internet and jobs um, is important. And I and I, I, I feel like in the future, if we have a more people-centric, user-centric, citizen-centered approach, uh, we Thanks are for on that. the right track. I, yes. I need to close this. So you've got 30 seconds, UK takeaways. Um, my key takeaway is that um, the internet is great for the economy, period, and all sectors of the economy. But, but to get the most out of it, we need to learn from one another. And hence, my, my plea for a global knowledge commons, even in the area of the internet, particularly in the area of the internet, because my thesis is that there is no challenge being faced by any society in this on this planet that hasn't been faced by somebody else somewhere, and perhaps in many cases, solutions already have been identified, or at least what can contribute to solutions. So sharing, sharing, sharing. Thanks, thank you. Sir, looks for you, last 30 seconds to put your views on what should be the key takeaways for this session. Okay, three things summarizing what we've heard. Connectivity should be recognized as one of the basic utilities alongside water, electricity, and sanitation for the future, for all the reasons you've heard. Secondly, we need enabling ICT architectures that put the citizen at the heart of everything we do and the point of da data connectivity for the future. That's the second one. And the third thing, the key enabler, is brave and bold leadership to take this agenda forward across nations.
Thanks, Gunjan. You have the last word, 30 seconds. You're on mute. I now. said it, uh, Dr. Gupta. I said it, you know, I, I'm a big believer in kind of entrepreneurship, online education. And you, if you intersect all that with the power of what's coming through ESG to help bridge the digital divide, I think that's where the answers lie. And that's where we should be focusing on collectively as a civic society. Thanks. Thanks, Gunjan. A very interesting discussion, a very actionable discussion. I'll follow through all this in our report and subsequently later connecting with each one of you. I think beyond bold leadership is the leadership at every level. I think we are going to change it. We're going to leverage internet for jobs, upskilling and make this world happier, better, prosperous and sustainable. Thank you all so very much. And thanks to IGF for giving us a wonderful platform to share our views and to shape the future of internet. Thank you Thank all. You.